Okay, we have with us today um, Professor Nigel King, who is a psychologist and well known for his work on template analysis, which is a, a form of qualitative data analysis. And I'm going to talk to him about that method and about what it involves and some of the issues that, that, that surround it. Okay, Nigel. Um, what I want to talk to you about is, is some of the steps that you go through in doing template analysis. So perhaps we can we can deal with, start with the beginning um, and, and and step through the process, and then perhaps later on talk to you a bit more about some of the issues underlying the, the approach. Let's start with with the starting point, which is constructing a template. Can you tell us what exactly is a template? And the method okay. is named after it, after all. Yeah, um, I <coughs> guess by I mean I should start by saying that the template approach. Uh, was already existing before I started work on it, though not very well known. Uh, and uh, I came across it in a book by Crabtree and Miller, which some people may be familiar with. Um, and uh, what what it suggested was an approach which kind of lies between the very top-down approaches that you see perhaps in some of the Miles and Huberman work on the Matrix approach and so on, and the very much bottom-up approaches of grounded theory and phenomenological methods such as IPA. So this central idea of the template is to produce a, a kind of coding frame that's organized in a certain manner, and we'll get on to talk a bit more about that, um, which rather than analyzing every transcript completely bottom up, you know, looking at it with no way prior assumptions about what you're going to be finding. What you actually develop a version of what you think is the first go at the the coding scheme, the template, and then you apply that to your analysis. And then instead instead of simply coming up with new themes every time, what you're doing is is modifying this first step at how the how the thematic analysis is going to be structured. So the template is actually a, a, a listing of codes. Yeah, yeah, a, a structured with. list. Right. Yeah. Or a structured diagram. And it has a hierarchy? It's, yeah, I mean, I would say template analysis is very much emphasizes hierarchical coding. I, I think, if you, I mean, most thematic. What does that mean? That means there are okay. some codes and subcodes yeah, and so on. Yeah, yeah. indeed. So, so that you have nested codes. So you have a broad theme. So you might have a theme like you know, if we were doing an interview about responses to being interviewed, for example, mm -hmm. you might have anxiety as a feeling and then you might say what are people anxious about or they might be anxious about what they look like or they might be anxious about whether they would remember what they were talking about etc mm -hmm. etc et and those would be sub themes of the first one yeah. now most thematic approaches have that kind of hierarchical structure as part of them but what I think you're seeing quite a lot of them whether as a matter of principle or as a matter of kind of habit and practice is that there's often a fairly set level of number of themes, thematic levels, as it were. Um, so in IPA, you usually see three different levels of coding, or in uh, the kind of, there's, there's a paper that psychologists might be aware of by Braun and Clark about thematic analysis, and that has, I think, three different levels. Whereas template analysis says, have as many levels as you find useful, mm -hmm. have as many as you like, and it's pretty common that those aspects of the data where you want to explore in a lot of depth and make quite a lot of fine distinctions, those you might have four or five levels of hierarchy. Whereas if there's areas that don't seem that relevant to your research question, you might only have a couple of levels. And that's one of the things that appealed to me about it to start with, it, is that pragmatically, on a lot of real world research, I guess, or applied research, which a lot of mine is, you know, it's not, you're not simply immersing yourself in it and seeing what you might find. There are some real world issues that you're supposed to be addressing, particularly with an evaluation type study. Um, and it enables you to sort of focus in on those aspects of it that really will answer the questions that you need to answer into quite a lot of depth, but also to capture at least at a broader level, other areas of interest. And I think one of the things that's valuable is that, it, you know, it, you have to get out of this frame of mind of saying, I've done the, the template, now that's it. You know, you've done a template for this task. Mm. 
for this piece of work. Maybe you're writing a report to an organisation funding body that's quite practically focused. But then, because you've done that, that, that more shallow coding to at least capture other areas that seem tangential, you know, you can go back and you can then deepen those. Right. So I think it's an approach that encourages more than some other thematic approaches a kind of open-endedness towards your data. Where does the template come from, that this initial template that you've got? So right. How do you construct yeah. it? Where does it come from? There's, there's two sources, really, of themes that, that to be incorporated within the initial template. And that is a mixture of the top down and the bottom up. So it, it's quite common, though not obligatory, and depends on your, your, your um, philosophical stance, methodological stance. It's quite common to have some a priori themes which will often relate to either specific theoretical ideas that this research is driven by or to practical issues relating to the aims of the research. So for example, um, we were recently doing some research um, looking at allotments and how having an allotment um, might have an impact on people's sense of health and well-being and so on. Now this was funded by an organisation that had put money into developing these allotments um, as part of a broader community health initiative. So as such, you know, there were certain issues around physical health, knowledge about food and nutrition, psychological well-being that we knew they wanted to address. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, having done the interviews, it was quite clear that those issues did make sense to people. So we would start developing a template with those as potential or a priori themes. Right. So they would be so there. A priori meaning you've already got them yeah, before you start. Yeah, you've got them in the, advance. The analysis. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you should never be at a stage where much of the template is there a priori. Usually I would say, you know, I might have two or three higher level themes, top or next level down, that are tentatively there in advance. But then what you do is that you do the very much bottom up very much like in IPA or in grounded theory, reading through the text and just highlighting anything that seems to be saying something of relevance to your research interest. Um, again, what's different from some other thematic approaches though is that instead of going through all of your material and then producing your coding scheme, um, whatever that might be called in a particular approach, the norm would be that you have a first go at developing a template on a subset of the data. Right. So let's say we had, I think it's right if I recall, uh, in one of the allotment studies, because there are actually two, in one of them we had I think 20 interviews. And it might be after five of those interviews, uh, we feel that there's quite a lot of common pattern emerging. Um, we've got some APRA concerns that are going to drive the, the template as well because of the way that the research is designed, what it's trying to do. Um, as a piece of applied research um, and so having done those five and analysed them in a typical thematic way, bottom up, you know, just notes in the margin then beginning to see how you can define those around particular themes, clustering them together you know, into meaningful clusters and then seeing well are some of these a subset of others no, the combination so of that. codes of the same kind of thing, yeah, but yeah. different versions of, yeah. or different varieties yeah. of, and so on. Yeah. Yes. So there might be a whole bunch mm. of things that are around the benefits of being in the open air. Mm. Okay, in fact, there was in this case. Um, and, you know, we might have had an April theme in general about benefits of the open air because I can't remember whether we did to be honest now but it's the sort of thing you might well do yeah. if that was one of the driving forces the rationales for the money behind the program that we're evaluating yeah. okay um, but then within that through reading through the detail of these five transcripts we find well there's actually some different nuances to that some of them are about escaping from something escaping from work or escaping from crowds of people some of them are about nature in itself being restorative, that was a kind of notion that was there. And those would be sub-themes that we might emerge. What we then do, looking at, as I say, this notional five transcripts, it's not necessarily that, but that could be an example, is produce a first go at the template with themes and sub-themes and so on. And when we get to transcript number six, instead of going at it cold, as it were, looking at line by line to see what we might 
possibly define as potential themes and so on. We actually go at it with the template in hand, literally there beside it. Mm -hmm. So when we read a bit in that sixth interview that says something interesting about, oh, it's great to be out watching the birds, I look on the template, the initial template, and say, have we got a theme that captures that? If we have, I code it to that. If we haven't, I say, well, that's a, I note that, that's something I need to come back to and modify the template potentially. Mm -hmm. And so you then have a kind of iterative process of looking at the template you've developed, looking at fresh material, and I'm saying transcripts, but it could be any textual qualitative yeah, sure. data, yeah. um, <coughs> and seeing you know, w whether there are things in this new material that lead to you wanting to revise the template. It sounds like then it's not just starting with, you don't start with the template necessarily, you actually may start with some interviews. Yeah. And that combined yes. with your ideas, yeah. Yeah. bring yeah. that together to yeah. construct yeah. the very first template yeah. when you've got a few yeah. interviews or that's few, right. few... And it's so it's different, some people may be familiar with things like framework analysis that's used mm -hmm. in health mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. uh, health service research quite a lot. And what they tend to do is really immerse yourself in, in the data, read through it a lot, but you're, mm -hmm. refer to your brief and your you know, your practical concerns yes, as well. Yeah, yeah. But then you kind of pretty much fix the categories, the thematic categories. Yeah. And from then on, unless you discover something that really doesn't work, pretty much that's it, they're going to go in those slots. Yeah. Yes. Where, whereas in template analysis, you always maintain the potential to go back and revise so you keep the your, your themes, yeah. including the APRA ones. Yeah. Nothing is sacrosanct. Right. Yeah. But, but it is, I suppose what I'm doing in a sense is saying that in many circumstances, you know, it's no good pretending that everything is kind of just emergent and bottom up because you've gone in there with issues in mind and things you're trying to find out. And as such, I think it's better to acknowledge that and have that as a potential theme related to others and then be saying, well, does the data actually fit that? Then kind of pretend you've discovered it, mm, mm. because you were going to discover that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm using discover with all the scare quotes on the uh, qualitative research you would do. Yeah. But I mean, I think you sometimes get that that kind of reaction that you should be going in with a complete blank slate. The you know the grounded theory model that you don't even look at the literature beforehand. But I think and maybe that works in some circumstances. And some phenomenological work, I, I wouldn't do that. I would try to be completely bottom up, as it were. Yeah, yeah. But I think a lot of work that is, has, a, has a kind of applied real world emphasis to it. You know, I think you, you should be trying to build that into the way you do the analysis. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I do think that one of the main selling points, as it were, for template analysis is that it's, it's, a, it's an approach that works well with a lot of applied type research. Yeah. And if I look at the, the feedback I get out where people are using it, and that's mostly through contacts that come through, through my website, um, or talking to people when I go around doing um, workshops and so on. You know, that it, it does tend to be around the more applied areas. Um, in, in, uh, I do some in clinical psychology, in, in work psychology, and also in, uh, in other disciplines. In fact, in, in business studies and mm. management, it's used quite a lot, and yeah. that kind of area. Right. So the main difference, it seems to me, between what you're saying now, or at least at this stage of analysis, and between what you're talking about in template analysis and grounded theory, is that grounded theorists would st they start with the tabula rasa, with, yeah. with, with no preconceptions about yeah. what's there, and start with the data and develop all your codes directly from the data, grounded in the data they were yeah. saying. And you're saying actually, in practical terms, that's often not a good way to start, but actually it's better to start with some preconceived a priori ideas that might be either led by your research aims or your, or your, um, your um, funders' uh, research requirements, or even theoretically yeah, led. Yeah, indeed, yeah, there might be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. that will give you a starting point, and then combine that with the much more kind of uh, interpretivist, um, as you put it, um, bottom-up type of approach yeah. that grounded theory recommends. Yeah. 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 Okay.